to our afternoon session keynote. And today we have the author of iPython, Dr. Fernando Perez, with us, who is going to share his thoughts and insights about open source and the full Python ecosystem. So I hope every one of us is coming. If you are not, and please call your companion to just come in, in the conference hall, the R0 conference hall, because the keynote is going to start. Okay, I suppose everyone knows it. And uh, Dr. Perez is here, and let, let us welcome him. Thank you, Ying Yun. I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is my, my first time in, uh, in Taiwan. In my first, I'm not like Wes, a veteran of, of uh, Asia Pacific PyCons. This is my first. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, and so what I want to um, talk to you about a little bit is the, the broad, a broad view on the intersection of two cultures, the culture of scientific research and the culture of the open source Python world. I am trained as a, I was trained as a scientist. I work at a university. I am an, an official sort of academic scientist. Um, but I think we have learned a lot as scientists from the open source community. Um, this is what I signed up for when I became a scientist. This was kind of the idea of science that I learned as a child, um, that it was a... The, a mission to try to understand the world um, as a collaboration between people everywhere um, uh, who would try to build verifiable answers that we had reasons to believe were reasonably correct and that we would build upon the, the work of others. Um, and then I became an actual scientist. I became a working scientist who had to actually make a living and get grants and publish papers and do all those things that we do. And the reality of science is a lot less glamorous than the promise of the ideals of science, unfortunately. Um, we tend to spend a lot of time really um, chasing an industry that I think in many ways has lost its ways uh, from what the idea about understanding nature um, and, and building a knowledge of the world around us was about. Um, and so what happened to me was that as I was uh, finishing graduate school, I started interacting with the open source community, I began writing open source software, and I've come to, to learn and to realize that the open source community actually has a lot of things to teach us as, as working scientists. Um, there are many, many things that the open source community does that in many ways um, are the things that we as working scientists uh, promised to ourselves and promised to society that we would be doing, and yet we don't. Um, the open source community is um, collaborative by definition. Uh, people work together all over the, using the internet as a means of communication. Um, competition can, coexi can exist and industries can build upon open source software and projects can even compete with one another, but the definition of the everyday process is, is actually an open collaborative one. It's a continuous process where you don't hold things in secret for years until you get that big paper published. Things happen in public continuously. Um, Software releases may happen as discrete events, but they are simply marking that a certain milestone has been reached as part of a public process where code has been reviewed, where credit has been allocated because the version control logs and the public mailing list discussions show who did what. And there's not the obsession that we have in academic science with keeping everything in secret until we get that big paper out and I am the first author on it so that I can get hired or promoted, etc. Um, the open source world has a culture of making its work reproducible by necessity. Um, if you and I are collaborating and you're here in Taiwan and I'm in the United States and we're trying to make a piece of IPython better, I need to know that you can download IPython and run it on your system and run the test suite. Um, and I need to be able to not trust that you will be up and running with pretty much the same results that I have back at home because I'm not going to be able to sit next to you to work together, right? We are going to be working in a distributed fashion. And so the open source community has built a combination of technical tools and culture and practice of making its work reproducible because it has to, because by necessity, a distributed collaboration model requires that everybody can work together on the same things. It tracks its bugs, it tests 
everything it does um, more or less systematically. Obviously, not every project has perfect test coverage. We know that. But there is a culture of knowing that there are problems in software, that it's inherent to the process, that we all make mistakes, and that we have to assume that as part of what we do and build machinery and mechanisms to track that. I have a colleague at Berkeley who told me, when I started interacting with open source people, it actually showed me how often my code was wrong. I used to simply write scripts, and once I got a figure that I thought could make for a good story for a paper, I could write it up and publish it and never look at that code again. And it turned out that once I began realizing how often I had mistakes and adding tests to everything, I saw that pretty much every time I wrote code, I made a mistake, and that that's okay if I take that as part of my process. And so these are things that we've really learned uh, from, from you guys. Um, science has become computationally a much more complex endeavor than it used to be. In the 1950s, computing was synonymous with scientific computing, and the only language that existed beyond uh, wiring actually wiring pieces of wire physically in the control panel of a computer in the, in, the in the late 40s or early 50s was Fortran, which was a language born for numerical computing. Today, as scientists, we have to do a lot more than numerical computing. We have many more things that we need to do mathematically, um, and we have non-mathematical things that we need to do. We have to, as scientists, we need our code to talk to databases. We need our code to parse files. We need it to handle text. We need it to talk over the network to a server. We need to expose its computations over a RESTful API, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't want to be doing all those things in Fortran. It is not a good tool for that. Python today is probably, as Wes was saying, it's not the perfect language at anything. It is probably the second best language at everything. But that is good because we have to do so many different things as scientists that having one tool that is the second best at everything is a really good solution, especially because Python also lets us continue reusing the decades worth of scientific codes in Fortran, in C, and in C++ that we can't abandon. When we as scientists use Python, we really mean we use Python plus C plus C++ plus, plus, plus Fortran, because we are not going to abandon all that code. We can't, and it would be foolish to imagine rewriting millions and millions of lines of very delicate code that we know do, do a good job. We just need to be able to use them in a more complex context, which is the context we have today. A very, very brief history of how this came to be for those of you who don't come from a scientific background. The history of Python and science actually dates back pretty far to the early days of the language. Guido van Rossum released Python in, in 1991, and by 1994, people were beginning to have discussions about adding matrix, operate, matrix objects to the language that led to the creation of a library called Numeric in 1995 by somebody who was, at the time, a graduate student at MIT, um, procrastinating on his graduate studies and instead writing open source code. And he started a long and continuing tradition of that. Both Wes and I followed exactly in that pattern of finding better ways to do, uh, better things to do than work on our graduate studies and instead write open source code. Um, Numeric led the way to Numeray, which was a library developed at the Hubble Space Telescope for large scale image processing. And then in 2005, the Numeric code base and the Numeray code base were finally merged into a new library called NumPy by Travis Oliphant, which today is what we use as the foundation of the scientific ecosystem. Together with SciPy, another library that Wes already mentioned, um, NumPy provides the core array object that lets us do fast numerics, things that Python is not good at. We can do them with NumPy. Um, and at the same time, in 2001, um, Travis Oliphant, together with Eric Jones and Paro Peterson, got together and wrapped a lot of Fortran code and created the SciPy project um, that, get, together with, at the time, Numeric, now NumPy, gave us a set of libraries um, to do scientific work that, uh, that was, became sort of the foundation of, of the modern scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and that dialogue has continued, and it has continued being a really productive dialogue. Um, this is something that just happened recently in the Python community. Those of you who follow the Python dev mailing list um, may have seen this happen. Um, in February of this year, Nathaniel Smith proposed um, this was reviving an old discussion about having a new operator for matrix multiplication in the language. And the proposal was to allow the at character to be a new operator in Python that would represent matrix multiplication. In April, Guido approved the PEP, PEP 465, uh, as a new operator. In April 8th, and on April 10th, 
the patch implementing it was already merged into the language. So in the span of a couple of months, this discussion led from the initial proposal into the approval. Now, this builds upon over 10 years of talking about this. This didn't happen overnight. Um, that PEP discussion was picking up old conversations about how we could better represent matrix multiplication. But it is a show of an, of, uh, an example of how productive the dialogue between the open, between the core Python community and the scientific Python community continues to be, that when we really present a case where, with an important need, the core Python community is willing to listen. For scientists, Python uh, gives us great things. We get separation of concerns and that the core Python team, you people, the people who are not scientists but who build tools with the language, you guys worry about the language and tools that we need without us scientists having to write those tools. Um, there's a great uh, uh, collaboration with industry in that there are many companies that are interested in Python and support the language and we indirectly benefit from that. Um, and we've also learned a lot from the culture of Python. Um, uh, reading, I personally have learned a lot simply from lurking and reading the Python dev discussions, seeing how Guido interacts with the community, seeing how all of the processes from mailing list management to community management to bug tracking, all of those things have informed how we do science and there's a movement in science to be more open, more reproducible that in many ways has the influence of, of, of this community, of the open source community woven throughout. Um, I would also like to argue that this dialogue goes both ways and that we also contribute. We as scientists are also giving Python good things. I think Wes already made a very compelling case for a lot of that and in many ways my talk follows on the arguments that Wes already made earlier. Um, NumPy is a tool that we developed because we needed it for scientific usage but it's really widely used. If you simply look at the Debian PopCon statistics which simply track for whoever runs PopCon on Debian what packages are installed. Uh, NumPy is reported as being installed on 58% of Debian systems that run PopCon. Obviously that's not because 58% of people need NumPy because they're writing NumPy code, but it means that NumPy is a dependency for so many things now in a big Linux installation that 58% of, of systems need it for something. Um, and so that speaks to the importance of the tool in the entire software ecosystem of, of, a, of a modern Linux installation. Um, if you have an app, uh, a Macintosh, and I see a bunch of um, Apple logos uh, just looking at the, at, the, at the public, if you're running 10.9 Mavericks, out of the box, you can import NumPy, import matplotlib, and make a figure without having to install anything whatsoever because Apple now on OS 10.9 ships Python, NumPy, and matplotlib out of the box. Um, it's an entire ecosystem of tools. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of this in details, but I just want to highlight that it's not just NumPy and SciPy. Now there's many other tools. Uh, Wes spoke about Pandas, Matplotlib, and Scikit-Learn, which form the cluster of what I would consider modern statistical and data-intensive computing in Python, and it's a great triad of projects. He also mentioned Cython for writing fast code and interacting with C libraries. Um, we saw a talk about the, uh, a graph, graph tool which is built upon the Boost Graph Library. There's kind of a similar companion to that called Network X, written in pure Python that's a little bit easier to build because BGL is really complicated to compile. We have tools for image processing, for 3D visualization, for symbolic computing, for many other things. So we really have a fairly rich, rich ecosystem. And we also bring a different community um, to, to the world of Python that I, I also think is valuable. Um, this is a community that has different usage patterns. We, we have different needs uh, from the, the typical uh, software engineering or web development or systems management uh, crowd. And that's good because it means that we bring a different perspective on the language. There are many things in the syntax of Python now, not many, but several things in the syntax of Python that have actually been included because they were needed for scientific computing. And I think that makes the language stronger. Having a diversity, um, as much as we need a diverse community of humans, having also a diversity of intellectual perspective and use cases is also valuable for making the language a better language and a stronger language. Um, and it's also important to remember that most of us scientists end up working in academic environments, which means we teach. And because we end up teaching, we tend to teach what we use, which means if we are teaching and we are using Python, there's a good chance we're going to teach the next generation of students Python. 
And that is happening. And so what's ha what we're seeing is that the more and more scientists use Python, the more they teach Python. So the more you see undergraduate students and even high school students learning Python. And so we scientists, even though many of you may think of us as esoteric people who are looking at particle physics data or astronomical images or, gen or gene sequencing data, we actually have this funny way to reach into the next generation of programmers because we teach them at our universities and that's probably a good thing for the language. So for example, um, we are teaching, and I'm sorry about that, that's, a, um, that's actually a, from, a, from PyCon in Canada um, that, I, that I forgot to remove uh, that note. There is no 415 talk by Software Carpentry uh, uh, leader, but Software Carpentry is an effort um, out of the Mozilla Science Laboratory where, um, led by Greg Wilson in Toronto, that tries to teach general scientists better computational practices. And it is basically embracing many of the things that I've just mentioned about the open source community, things like version control, uh, good uh, software documentation, testing as, a, as, a, as an everyday practice, and Python programming, teaching that to working scientists. And it's a project that is, that is gaining a lot of traction uh, in, uh, in scientific disciplines. Um, I don't know, I want a very, very quick, uh, I want to ask a quick question of the audience. Is anyone here a software carpentry instructor who has taught, uh, taught a workshop in Taiwan or anywhere in Asia? No, I don't see any hands go up. Well, if you're interested, I really encourage you to go have a look at the Software Carpentry website. They are always looking for instructors to teach Python and good practices about computing to working scientists. You don't need to be a scientist who knows anything about genetics or astronomy or geophysics because you will be teaching good basic computational practices. Get in touch with them. They build an international team of instructors who teach all over the world and you will be helping scientists do better computing in their research. Um, another important point uh, that, uh, that actually dovetails, as I said, perfectly with what Wes was describing this morning is the fact that there's this whole buzz about data science uh, where industry now all of a sudden is very, very in interested in doing heavy duty analytics and tools like Pandas and NumPy and Matplotlib are rising rapidly and so the scientific community built a stack for research that is actually becoming a bridge with industry and a very valuable one. This is a slide taken from the abstracts from the Strata conference, which is a very business-oriented conference that happens both in Silicon Valley and in Europe. And the, the lines that you see rising there are for IPython and for Python. They are becoming some of the most sort of sought-after tools in the business side of data science. Um, and so, again, since my theme is sort of this dialogue between our two communities, this is showing how the scientific community is building tools that are now reaching back into the world of Python as a business tool um, and helping that become stronger. Um, wrapping up with the data science thing, I want to very briefly mention um, a project that is happening in the United States that I'm very involved with um, that I think is very interesting. We are creating a new initiative for building what we call data science environments. Um, the University of California at Berkeley that I belong to, together with the University of Washington and New York University, uh, we were recently awarded um, a grant from the Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation for five years to build environments for data science basically places where the intersection of th scientific research, data analysis, statistics and, 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 uh, and applied mathematics and computer science tools and software engineering would have a place. Um, this is an intersection that has a really hard time in academic circles because it's more focused on building good computational tools than on just publishing papers. And we were given five years and almost $40 million to try to figure this out. Um, uh, we're very excited. It's a really hard problem to tackle. Uh, we have to change how the institution itself behaves and there's a good chance we will fail, but we're still going to give it a try. Um, in education, scientists are bringing things like courses in data science. Um, if any of you has interest in learning good data science uh, uh, in, in Python, please go to cs109.org. It's a beautiful data science course out of Harvard where all of the problem sets and all, the, all of the lectures are written as long, beautiful IPython notebooks. They've done an absolutely terrific job. Um, and finally, I want to mention NumFocus. NumFocus is a foundation that the scientists have created. Uh, all of the people in the in the, in sort of the, the scientific Python and Python data ecosystem we got together a few years ago and we created a foundation to bridge the culture of 
the scientific computing uh, world together with industry so that we could get funding for open source. So we sort of play a role similar to that of the Python Software Foundation of the PSF, but more, more focused on, on scientific code. So this is another example of how of how we are, uh, we're building these, uh, sort of these bridges between the two cultures. Um, zooming in from that into the world that I have spent my time on, um, I wanna speak for a little bit about IPython itself because that's sort of how I came into, into this world. In 2001, I was a graduate student finishing a dissertation in particle physics and like every self-respecting grad student looking for something else to do rather than work on the dissertation. And, uh, and my, my, my brilliant idea was to spend an afternoon uh, writing an improved interactive Python shell, just tweaking a little bit how sys.displayhook worked um, and sys.ps1 and sys.ps2 worked so that I could get better prompts um, in Python. And uh, 13 years later, I'm still working on that. Um, I Python began its life as a, uh, as a better shell, um, but that afternoon hack that began as a 250 line Python script, which is up on, on GitHub, I put it up as a, as a gist, that had a little bit of plotting, a little bit of numerics, and a little bit of sort of systems access into it, um, has grown now into, um, as, as of the latest official version that we released a couple months ago, IPython 2.0, into, into something that has over 150,000 lines of code and does lots and lots of things. Um, it's obviously not my work anymore. Now, many, many, many people work on it, over 300 contributors in the Git log. Uh, importantly, I want to highlight how uh, I re we really have an amazing core team of developers who put a lot of time into the project. The people whose names are bold-faced are actually uh, full-time funded to work on the project. In particular, uh, Brian Granger, who's my sort of co-partner in crime. Um, he's a physics professor at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, three hours south of where I live. Um, and Min Reagan Kelly, uh, Thomas Clover, and Paul Ivanov, they all work with me at Berkeley. Jonathan Frederick works with Brian um, at Cal Poly, and the rest are volunteer members of the open source uh, core um, IPython team. And if it weren't for them, none of this would exist because I certainly wouldn't have done um, all of this work. We also receive support um, both from private foundations, from government foundations, and from industry. And this is a good illustration of how this is a tool that was born in academic circles but reaches out um, into both private philanthropy and industrial research. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, and and we're, we're thankful for the support of, of, of all of these parties. If it wasn't for that, uh, obviously we couldn't pay the salaries of the people who work on the project. Um, but I just said that IPython has 150,000 lines of code, and do you really need that much code to basically do something which is execute source in a diction, in a namespace? Because at the end of the day, that's what we do. You type code, we execute it, and we give you the answer back. So why do you need 150,000 lines of code to do that? Um, no matter how bad of a software engineer you are, you should be able to do it in less than that. And so the answer is not that we're complete idiots that don't know how to write more concise code, is that IPython has grown from being a shell into being a much, much more ambitious project that really tries to represent what is it that you do when you do computing, when you type code to execute and you get the answer back, and to abstract all that into protocols and formats so that you can control interactive computational systems locally or remotely and work with their output in a variety of ways. And so we, the best analogy that I can think of to explain what the modern abstractions in IPython are, are the, the web itself, HTTP and HTML. HTTP is a protocol for systems to exchange content over the internet and to transfer. It's the hypertext transfer protocol. That's what it stands for. And HTML is a format to store um, that data. And what we have is a protocol to drive a computational engine and a format to store that. This talk that I'm presenting is actually stored as an IPython notebook as a document that I can execute. Um, and it controls a shell that's running in my local system, the IPython shell, uh, uh, what we call like a kernel. And in addition to that, we have libraries for parallel computing, because once you're controlling one engine, you could control many of them. Once you've defined things in terms of a generic protocol and a set of generic abstractions, you can control many more. Um, and we also have a notebook sharing service that I'll show in a minute, but that Wes already mentioned this morning. Um, whoops. And so what, when, when you run IPython, what can you do? Uh, abstractions aside, well, this, this is the kind of thing that makes Python so, so appealing and that Wes already talked about. When you import pandas, you can tell pandas in one line of code to read a CSV file. In this case, I it's a CSV file that I actually downloaded using pandas itself that knows how to read data 
from uh, financial services. And then I simply say, I need to grab, this is stock data for, in this case, Microsoft between 2000 and 2002, and I need to grab the high, low, and adjusted close prices of the stock, and I want to plot them. So one single line of code actually gives me reading a data file, loading into an intelligent data structure like a pandas data frame, um, f selecting a few fields out of the file and visualizing that in a single line of code. This is the kind of beauty um, of, I Pyth of, uh, of, of, of Python. And to show you that this is actually code, I can actually change that code here and we run this. And, uh, and in this case, I've changed, uh, I've changed the plot. This is running live code, right? This is not a PowerPoint. This is not a PDF. I am running inside of Chrome. And what I'm running is I'm running the IPython web notebook controlling a shell, which instead of being the shell in the terminal from 2001, it's a shell that's listening over a set of network sockets and being, being communicated with um, from the web browser. So once we have this idea that what matters is interactive computing and understanding our data uh, and understanding uh, our code uh, by directly being able to play with it, um, then what, what happens is the world opens up to not just being Python. And Wes mentioned that we have a close relationship with a language called Julia. Um, and this shows you how close that relationship goes. Um, you don't need to read all this code. What matters is to see that in IPython you can say, double percent Julia, and you can write a block of code, and that block of code can execute both Python expressions and Julia expressions and return an answer, which is a figure created with the matplotlib plotting library. So from inside the Python code, I'm calling out to the Julia code, which itself is reusing the Python libraries to give me an answer back. Um, and once I've once I've gotten that figure, I can actually grab that figure as a Python variable and even display it and manipulate it further in Python. So I have a complete integration between these two languages that are working in memory. And they actually, that integration actually goes pretty deep. This is a bit of code that is actually worth for a second explaining. So what we have here is the classic Fibonacci sequence from the Python tutorial, this little this little recursive function that everybody who has seen the Python tutorial has seen. But in this case, it's implemented as a two-step recursion instead of a one-step recursion, where each step of the recursion calls a different function. And one of them is in Julia, and the other one is in Python. So in here, you have, when you make a call to fib2, which is a Python function, you pass it a pointer to fib, which is a Julia function. This is Julia syntax. This is Python syntax. And you can see that it's switching from Julia to Python, and you see the stack unraveling. The recursive stack is actually a layer of Julia and Python being interleaved um, uh, as the recursion unfolds. Um, that's kind of amazing that we can have this level of collaboration. And this is the beauty of a language like Python, which is completely open, and the work, the amazing work that the Julia team has done to make this possible. This is a little bit of a mind bender, but it's really interesting to see the kind of things that we can do. And obviously, this is a mind bender that's a party trick. There's no point in doing this in production. But th what this is showing is how deeply the two languages can work together. And what underpins this possibility actually enables many, many other really interesting things. Um, We've also added tools. Um, now that we're running inside of a web browser, we've added tools to make it possible to interact with your code and your data, not only by typing more code, but also by having graphical controls that make it possible to explore things visually. So let's imagine that you want to compare two images. You can write a very simple function that blends, blends the two images into a third to see how they compare. And if you call the function, you'll see the three figures. But it would be nice. It would be nice to be able to do this interactively. And so if instead of calling the compare function, I say interact with the compare function, then I will get a slider in IPython that will let me do this. As I drag the slider, it's computing either one or the other. And I can play with this. And what's happening is this little bit of code right here is all I have to write to go from a function call that only executes once, to having a graphical control right here that lets me explore the parameter space of this function. And I didn't have to write any GUI code. This is all I had to write. Import, interact, and fixed, and say, call the compare function, but I want a the A and B images fixed, but I want the S parameter that blends them to be a slider between 0 and 1. And with that, every time I drag the slider, the code is getting called, and I'm getting the answer back. So this, this is part of IPython 2.0, and it's this idea of giving us tools to explore our data interactively. 
Um, if I have a data frame, for example, I, we all use spreadsheets, but I don't like them. I don't like spreadsheets because they conflate input code and, and output in one entity. So what I would like to have is tools like Pandas data frames that let me express what I'm doing with code, but I still want to be able to manipulate the data. The data entry part and the data cleaning part of spreadsheets is really nice, being able to just type into cells. And so if we have a data frame, um, if we have a Pandas data frame and we add a little bit of JavaScript around it in what I'm calling a data sheet, uh, we get something like this that will display like a data frame. Um, but then we can edit it. And if we edit it here, we get, a little, we get a little JavaScript table where as we make edits, as we type into this, into this table, then those edits get reflected here automatically. So I'm actually editing the, the data structure in memory. And once I've done my edits, those edits actually show up in the, and the new values um, appear. So we have the beginnings of tools by having this combination of client-side JavaScript, which is deeply connected to the execution in the back end. We are beginning to have the tools that give us the ability to manipulate data in ways that up until now were tied up in tools like spreadsheets. And uh, we can do a lot more than that. So this is an example. Once we have, imagine that you wanted to explain to a child or to someone how numbers are factorized. So you want to show that the number six factorizes into two and three, and you write a little bit of a factorization algorithm, but you want to visualize this. So one thing to do would be to create a little graph, and, and the D3 library knows how to display graphs, and it, it has a automatically built into it a force-directed graph layout object. So if you return the right data in JSON to D3, it'll do the display for you. Um, and so what we've built here is, again, this is using the same APIs in Python, a tool that will, lets us, will let us send data to the library. I know 72 has a lot of factors, so that's the one I wanted to pick. But as the data is coming, into the library, the D3, li as the data is coming from the kernel in Python, the D3 library is actually continuing to respond. So what we have is both a client-side library, which is the same one that Wes was using in his data visualizations, together with a kernel process which is sending data to it. And I can have event handlers going both ways where the client-side library is operating and communicating with the computation in the kernel. In this case, the computation is a trivial integer factorization. It's just a cute example. You can imagine the computation being something which is running against your, your data-intensive backend and updating in real time your data visualization. And you can have event handlers on the client side in JavaScript that are communicating back with, uh, with your engine. And we can use this. Brian Granger last week uh, wrote a gorgeous little example using Leaflet, uh, which is a library that uses OpenStreetMaps to provide interactive mapping, right, that returns returns widgets that provide mapping. Um, so I can make a map, in this case, with the coordinates of type A. But I can then interact with that by simply saying, I want to interact with the zoom level of my map. And I get a slider here that will automatically control, control my map. So I don't have to write any code. And I get interactive JavaScript controls that are calling back into my computational back end um, on, the, on the other end. OK, where's my browser? Thank you very much. So we'll probably be writing JavaScript for a long time to come, but at least we can do it with a brain. And we can do it with a kernel in the back end that can do interesting computing. All of this is predicated on having this notion of a kernel that executes code and uses a protocol. And once we have this well-specified protocol, we can build kernels in any language we want. Right now, we have, lang we have kernels in about 11 or 12 different languages. I, I, think, I think there's 12. I think I'm missing one here. Um, and you can write kernels for your favorite language. I already showed you the Python one. This is a very quick example of a Julia notebook that uses the same machinery, but instead of Python, this is pure Julia. And it does visualizations. Before, I showed you how to call a snippet of Julia from inside Python. In this case, this is pure, pure Julia. There's no Python in the picture. And I can run native Julia code uh, using the same thing, which means I can share my computational work with in the form of a notebook, even if that work is done in Julia or in R or in any of the other languages that we also support. And this has led to an ecosystem of tools growing around 
this machinery. Now that we have a generic set of tools, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a growing ecosystem where we can do our research and share it and collaborate and work regardless of the language. This is an example of an academic publication that, that we did um, last year. Um, where we did some work in collaboration with biologists uh, running in parallel using the IPython parallel machinery in the cloud, um, and we published an academic paper that was accompanied by all of the notebooks to replicate it and the Amazon machine images. So if you want to replicate this computation, all you have to do is start with your own Amazon account with that machine image, and then you will be able to replicate exactly the same computation. Again, this is something where we're learning how to use the tools of the open source community to make, um, to make scientific research um, more collaborative and, 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 uh, and more reproducible. Um, we're also using this to communicate technical content in many ways. Um, a lot of work these days, a lot of interesting communication these days happens in blogs. So this is an example of a blog post by Jake Vanderplas, uh, which is actually a notebook. So the idea is that if you want to write a technical blog post and you write it in this format, you can publish it directly. Jake actually wrote a Pelican plugin so that you can drop your blog post as a notebook into Pelican. But that blog post will have all the code in it so that your readers don't have to wonder what you, whether what you did was right. They can download it and run it locally. And so this is his blog. And at the, at the bottom of the blog, there's kind of the usual discussion that happens in a blog. But the readers can download the post and, uh, and, uh, and have a discussion based on the actual code, uh, rather than simply arguing sort of in a vacuum, wondering whether the assumptions of the author were correct. Similarly to papers and blog posts, even books are being developed in this fashion. So this is an example of a book that was actually written as a complete collection of notebooks. Um, the book was published by Springer, a traditional academic publisher. You can buy it on Amazon, and it's a hardcover book. I have a copy in my office. But you can also clone it as a, Git rep as a repository on GitHub and execute every chapter of the book is actually a notebook. So the entire book was created in this fashion that makes it possible to, for the audience to replicate and reproduce all of the results. This is another example of a book that was written not as a collection of notebooks. In this case, the author wrote it separately, but the author included a collection of notebooks for all the examples of the book. So if you're interested in social network analysis uh, of social network data, you can actually go through all the exercises in the book um, in this fashion. And you don't have to wonder whether the author copy-pasted right right or not. Um, all of this, as Wes mentioned, is being shared via the Notebook Viewer. The Notebook Viewer is a service that we run at nbviewer.ipython.org that allows anyone to share notebooks by simply pasting in the URL of a notebook, and we will render it for you. So this is an example. I just clicked on that. And this is an example. Uh, where did it go? This is an example of a Ruby kernel that, um, that I can view, and I don't have to have anything installed, because what happens is when I go here, the NB Viewer website will render it for me. So if you want to share your work with someone, they don't have to have anything installed. You, can g you put it publicly somewhere, and you give them this URL, and then they will be able to view it. Now, if I actually want to run this code, obviously I have to download it, but NB Viewer gives me a link here, and I can download that notebook, and then I can run it locally. Obviously, at that point, I may need to have some code installed. But the point is, by having, by having this tool available, we've made it very, very easy for folks to share their work. And we see a lot of traffic on this. And this was an interesting recent example where um, a blog post came up in the United States from an organization that is doing data-driven journalism. It's an organization called 538 um, that does statistical analysis of public data. Um, and that became very famous because they predicted the results of the United States presidential elections with high accuracy by having good statistical models. Um, but they published an article about gender issues in, uh, in the funding of Hollywood movies. Um, and they published a long article about it, but they didn't include any of their data and any of their code. So it was kind of interesting that they were talking about sort of how to better do journalism with code and data, but they didn't actually publish code or data. And so after they published this, Brian Keegan, who's an amazing uh, researcher at Nor Northeastern University, published this. It's the, I should have opened this one in advance. Um, um, it, he published this amazing notebook. And I'm simply going to scroll just so you get a sense of how much work went into this. It's an amazing analysis of, of 
of that article where he, recre he recreated the entire analysis, fetched, got a bunch of data, did more analysis, built a more complex statistical model, and basically said, if you guys are going to do this, you need to make your code and data available because this is how it's done. And to their credit at 538, they replied and they said, 538 and similar sites should make their code and data available and they actually posted a GitHub repository afterwards with their code and data. So this is an example where these practices from the open source community are actually changing even how journalism and fairly high profile sites uh, that are right now getting a lot of press and have the New York Times all worried um, are actually having an impact and making the process a more open and a more collaborative one. Others are building things on top of this infrastructure. There's um, open source and commercial players that are building tools with IPython. And Thought uh, is a company in Austin that builds uh, a uh, scientific IDE called Canopy that includes IPython. Um, Continuum Analytics is another Austin company that actually hosts a service called Wakari um, that hosts notebooks in the cloud. Uh, Microsoft, uh, for those of you who are on Windows, builds a really, really good plugin that lets you run um, Python tools inside of Visual Studio and has IPython integration as well as excellent debugging capabilities because you can do cross-language debugging. Um, they also support IPython, works very well on the Azure Cloud Platform. We did some testing and development of tools with them to run cluster computing on the Azure Platform with IPython. Um, uh, if you want to run on, Am on the Amazon ecosystem instead of the Microsoft ecosystem, there's a project called Star Cluster out of MIT. That's what we used for that uh, biology paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, Star Cluster lets you spin up a cluster of tools uh, of, of, of parallel uh, IPython engines with a notebook with, with a simple, uh, with just one command and makes it very easy to run, um, run your computations in the cloud on Amazon. IBM, uh, the team that uh, turns the Watson platform into uh, a machine learning driven analytics platform, actually transitioned from a lot of in-house Java code into using IPython and they gave a really good talk last year at the SciPy conference where they showed how moving to the IPython platform made the code, uh, the code a lot smaller. Uh, they moved from about 8,000 lines of code, of 8,000 8, lines of Java to a few hundred lines of Python and simultaneously they had the web notebook environment to do all the analytics and the reporting with a lot less work. Um, there are startups doing um, academic publishing. So Authoria is a startup that lets you do collaborative editing of academic publications in the cloud and they support IPython notebooks as well. Um, there's another startup that uh, called Plotly that lets you actually host your data in the cloud, um, but render it in IPython as interactive D3 plots. Um, but every time you make one of these plots, even though you get your plot right here embedded, you also have a link to the original plot and data in their website so that you can collaborate with others. So this is just to show how these tools that are coming from a single open source environment are now being reused and remixed in many ways uh, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, both commercial and open source players. Um, we have a new project to try to help you with diffing and merging of these notebook files. Once you start collaborating with these things, it turns out that on disk, they're not plain text files. They are JSON data structures, and diffing a JSON data structure looks ugly. Uh, and so uh, some students at the University of Toronto have been building tools to help you with merging and diffing these tools. This is a great project to contribute to. If any of you is interested in this class of problems, these students need some help. And right now, we in IPython don't have the bandwidth for it. Um, and um, finally, I want to mention something new that just happened, um, whoops, which is uh, something called Collaboratory. Collaboratory is a new experiment um, that we are running with, uh, with Google Research. This is something that was developed um, at Google Research recently, uh, and we're announcing it today um, as, a, as a project to try to explore what would it look like if you wanted to run these tools but collaborate with the real-time APIs and environment of Google Docs. So what happened was a team at Google Research ported IPython, NumPy, and Matplotlib to run inside of Chrome as a Chrome web app, uh, storing the notebooks in Google Drive and giving you the live Google collaboration. This is very much an experiment. We're just getting started. I actually learned about this 
um, just a week ago. I, had a, I came back from a trip and I went downtown, I went down to Mountain View to meet with the team from Google Research. This was worked on uh, by Corina Cortes' team um, in, uh, at Google Research in New York, um, together with Matt, Matt Turk, um, who's at uh, University of Columbia, also in New York, and who's the lead developer for the YT project in astrophysical data analysis. And uh, what happened was they built this system that gives me, when I go to my Google Drive, if I want to create a new file, in addition to making a new document, I can also make a new collaboratory notebook. It takes a second to initialize, so I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to try to initialize it live in front of you guys, but what I want to show is that here, I have a notebook that I can run, I can print, hello, whoops, PyCon APAC, and it executes output just the same, but here I'm collaborating with Wes McKinney, who's sitting in front of the audience and who's typing right there, and that's Wes, and when he runs the code, um, he can type it, and this is being stored on Google, on Google Drive live. As we, as we are working, um, this is being stored on Google Drive. Wes just made a plot, and, uh, and now I can, I can recreate this plot, I can change uh, I can change the value of alpha here to be that, and they get much more transparent. But in the meantime, Wes has created another plot here. So we have real live collaboration with Google Docs, uh, and all of the, all of the folks there um, are, are logged in in New York. Um, we're going to put this um, as an open source project. Google is going to open source this uh, this week. We have, uh, we have a, a development meeting on Monday that unfortunately I'll be missing. We're quite excited about this. It's obviously very much an experiment. We're not exactly sure where this is going to go. There's a lot of new code and we, we just found out about it recently. Um, but it's a very interesting example of how these tools that were built in the open source world, once we build the right abstractions and the right protocols can be picked up by organizations such as Google Research. Um, and we'll see where this takes us. We're going to have a, a close look at the code and see how this uh, can hopefully become, uh, become part, uh, uh, part of, the future, uh, of the future of computing. So to wrap up, just so that we have a few minutes for discussions and questions, um, I want to sort of uh, reflect on how I came to this intersection of Python and science. Uh, I've seen this quote, actually, at, at the previous PyCon conference in Montreal. Uh, Brett Cannon, interestingly, one of the core Python developers, basically said exactly the same thing that I'm saying here. Uh, but I remember thinking this years ago that I came to Python for the language because I really got hooked Keep in mind, I was coming from Perl, so uh, that, 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 that was my baseline. Uh, but, uh, but I really got hooked by the language back in 2001 as a grad student, but I really stayed because of the community, because I've learned so many things and I've found so many amazing things um, in the Python community, both on the scientific side and in the broader open source Python community. Um, and the dialogue between these two communities is only getting better. Uh, we are having um, even more interesting conversations with the core Python team that I think are going to make the, the future of Python and science an even brighter one. Um, on the IPython side, I hope I've convinced you that by building this combination of language agnostic protocols and tools, um, we have a format and we have tools that are valuable not just for scientific research, for, but for a much broader audience that includes, that hopefully includes all of you um, and not just us. Um, and I finally want to wrap up by, by thanking Guido, who created all of this and that, that made possible conferences like this, and the core Python team that does such a great job with leading the, uh, leading the, the maintaining and the development of the language. Language, um, and all of the team here that, uh, that made this conference possible. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and I will be here for the next couple of days. So if you have questions that don't fit into the time we have, I'll, I'll be happy to chat with you after. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. Please go ahead if you have any questions to Fernando. Yes. Hi, Dr. Perez. Um, you mentioned that you use a uh, uh, Python script instead of your dissertation. So, do you think if it's possible someday all of the journals accept uh, uh, Python notebook as a format for publications? 
So we don't have any journal that yet accepts an actual notebook as a publication. And there's a couple of limitations in making a notebook a, an actual paper yet. We can convert to LaTeX and to PDF really well, but bibliographic management is the weak spot right now. We don't have a good story for bibliography yet. But we are in conversations with several publishers in how to better support notebooks as part of the publication workflow. So this is something for which we don't have, there is, no, there is not a single one that yet does it officially, but I'm hoping that will change in the next year. We are in conversations with several publishers, especially the more open, open, open publishers like PLOS um, and Frontiers platforms, as well as scientific societies like SIAM and AGU. Um, and so I really do hope that we'll make a lot of progress on this in the near future, because some of these publishers are very, very interested. And any questions? Or you are just a uh, bit shocked by that demo? <laughs> 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 so are you recovered? <laughs> so any question if you want to ask? And if not, I'll be happy to talk to you offline afterwards. I'll be here for the next couple of days. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's check it again. <laughs>